This episode of TopCast is brought to you by UCF Online. 20 plus years of award-winning online excellence, over 75 online programs, one of the largest and most innovative universities in the U.S. UCF.edu slash online. From the University of Central Florida's Center for Distributed Learning, I am Tom Cavanaugh. And I'm Kelvin Thompson. And you are listening to TopCast, the teaching online podcast. Hi, Kelvin. What's up, Tom? Not much. I am ready to do some podcasts. Woo, let's do it. Yeah. I, was, I just came for the coffee. <laughs> well, you're, you're ruining the surprise for any new listeners that we oh, have. Oh, you think people be surprised that we have coffee? Yeah. Now, none of our regular listeners, both of them. Yeah. Right. <laughs> you know, we, we talk about this sometimes, right? I mean, I think at this point, some people are like, stop, don't fast forward. Because some people think, you know, what somebody, somebody said, oh, yeah, you guys were on this tangent about coffee. And somebody else said, oh, yeah, skip past the coffee till I realized it actually has something to do with the show. I, I have heard both anecdotally. So for... <laughs> For those who hate the banter, uh-huh. sorry, I'm going to banter for just a uh-huh. moment. But some people like the coffee bit, mm-hmm. and we don't do it too long. I, I don't hope not. think we're being a little meta here. Yeah, and some people hate the coffee bit I and know. just want us to get to talking about online learning. Yeah, I don't know. We are complex, so as a way to try and thread the needle, we will talk about coffee, but not for very long. Yeah, or banter for not very long. Hope so. Maybe we'll just do one banter episode and. <laughs> Make it, you know, a very special top cast for those who are all very special top <laughs> who don't care about online learning, but maybe want to new like Kelvin's, you know, uh-huh. coffee tour or something. Yeah, okay, maybe, maybe. Uh, there was that one episode about the open, free and open online resources, and you about went off the rails because we I think we're at six minutes before we <laughs> really got into the, uh, yeah. the topic. I remember that I was tiring of the banter at that point. <laughs> I have a high tolerance. Yeah. Well, we're a minute 48 into it now. (laughs) See, you have a low tolerance. (laughs) I think anybody can sit through a minute 48. Yeah, okay. All right. So uh, you want to do this show or what? Let's go. Okay, let's do it. What are we talking about again? We are talking about, so the theme for today is to talk about how to address online learning to people who don't necessarily live like us in the world of online learning. Well, that is true. And, you know, after all that talk about talking about coffee, we never did actually talk about the coffee. So I was setting you up with that thank theme. You. Well, that's good because I've got something. So here's what you're drinking, Tom. Okay. It, it's almost, it almost doesn't matter, but it does. <laughs> uh, here's, okay. It's a, it's a uh, Rwanda Hingakawa uh, coffee from uh, Starbucks Reserve. So they're small batch roasted stuff and they do a little bit. But here's why I brought this coffee. So uh, recently, a few weeks ago, I was sitting in uh, my local Starbucks, which has the, the high-end coffees, which, you know, I've uh, spent a lot of money on. And uh, the manager walked over. I was doing some work in the afternoon. She comes by, and she drops in front of me two unopened bags of whole bean coffee. And I'm like, well, I didn't order that. I looked at her. I'm like, what? Is Thank up? you for putting my kid through college. Uh, yeah. right. And it was kind of like that. <laughs> no joke. It was. I looked at her questioningly and she said, here, I just thought you'd like this. And, you know, you're in here all the time. And, here you go. and I was like, yeah, my Porsche outside appreciates the fact. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so it made me it made me smile. I really appreciated it. And so since it made me smile, this coffee, I thought it was appropriate for today. Oh, I get it now. Mm-hmm. All right. So um, do you want me to set it yeah, up or do you want to set it? it up? No, you go for that. All right. So in December of 2016, I had the opportunity to appear on the Tavis Smiley Show on PBS on television and talk about online learning. So I get the smile mm. that was brought to your Tavis face. Tavis Smiley. Tavis Smiley. Yes. Yeah. And, and the, uh, the interview that I did uh, with um, Tavis Smiley uh, was part of a wider series that he did over the past mm-hmm. season, a periodic series. It wasn't every episode um, about education and educational innovation and things that are making a difference mm-hmm. in education. Um, other people that he had interviewed was, were the chancellor from the City Colleges of Chicago, mm-hmm. Cheryl Hyman, mm-hmm. and uh, Janet Napolitano from uh, California. 
mm-hmm. and uh, and me. <laughs> it's good company yeah, to that's be good. in. That's, yeah. that's good, Tom. Um, and the episode that I was on that aired, um, there he usually interviews two guests, mm-hmm. uh, unless it's sort of a, an extended one where where he'll do one through two segments. But mm-hmm. for me, it was two two s- segments on the same show, and the the one that followed me was uh, Simone Biles, uh, the gymnast. Oh, there you go. Yeah, me and Simone. That's good. And I think, uh, you know, they've, I've seen, it's interesting, they package up this content differently. So one of the podcasts they had uh, there, it was a different order. And so it was you, and then it was uh, the actress, uh, Tandy Newton. Oh, yeah, I didn't see that. In the podcast feed, not too far off from you, was Dick Van Dyke. So Wow. Yeah, you're in good company, Tom. Yeah, well, I, just as a quick cul-de-sac here, I, I was told who else um, Smiley was interviewing that day um, because – you, I used to work in the television industry, and mm-hmm. uh, we used to record multiple episodes mm-hmm. in a day. Um, so he did six interviews, I think, that day. Wow. And among the people he interviewed, I was the first one on the on the schedule. Were Simone Biles, um, Robert Wagner, mm-hmm. um, Conan O'Brien, Warren Beatty, and Joe Buck. So that cool. was pretty cool. Yeah. yeah. And Tom Cavanaugh. And Tom Cavanaugh. Awesome. That's right. So th- you, you started to say this, but how did, how do you how this come about? I mean, how do you connect with you? Do you know? Yeah, as I understand it, um, you know, we've done some some work with the Bill and Melinda Gates mm-hmm. Foundation. Mm-hmm. Uh, they've they kind of know a little bit about us through some work that we've done through the Next Generation Learning Challenges, and uh, the University of Central Florida is part of the University Innovation Alliance, which has a relationship with the Gates Foundation and. Um, as I understand it, the Gates Foundation has something of a partnership with hmm. the Tavis Smiley group hmm. to um, to talk about education issues, hmm. yeah, cool. and um, and I believe I was referred to them through through that channel. Still a cool connection, however it came about. Yeah, pretty pretty, pretty neat. And as you said toward the top of the show, I and I think this is true. Um, we all have to deal with answering questions about online education. I, I personally think that your interview here is a good example of responding to questions and assumptions about online education broadly. So, I mean, here's a guy who's, I mean, clearly smart, informed, connected, and uh, he had, I mean, I think some really good questions, but some fundamental questions. And uh, sometimes that flummoxes me. Not always, I can be I can be geared up, right? But, but you handled him, I thought, uh, really, really well. And I think that's illustrative. So maybe we'll cut to the interview and we'll come back and we'll kind of unbundle it a little bit and see if we can find some principles that the rest of us can up- apply. How's that sound? Sounds good. Let's uh, take a listen. Please welcome Thomas Cavanaugh to this program. He is the Associate Vice President of Distributed Learning at the University of Central Florida. He joins us tonight to talk about the success of the university's blended learning programs and the societal influence that technology is having on education and training and tune in tonight because they this they say is the wave of the future for how students will be taught in this country tom cavanaugh good to have you on this program thank you for having me let me jump right in tell me what you all are doing that everybody's paying attention to now because you're doing it so successfully with regard to blending these online and classroom programs sure um at the university of central florida we're a large school we have 64,000 students Mm -hmm. and access is really important to us and we really, frankly, wouldn't be that large if it wasn't for online learning, because we simply don't have the physical infrastructure mm-hmm. to support that many students. So what we offer students is a variety of modalities that they can choose from to fit their lifestyle, fit their work, their family commitments. And what we find is that close to almost 80% of our students take one or more online or blended courses throughout their academic, uh, throughout an academic year. Mm-hmm. Tell me how a blended program works. Like, How does one choose or how do you know what's online, what's classroom, how do you balance the hours? I mean, how, do, how does the blended part actually work? Sure. Well, there's different levels. Right. So at the course level, you can blend a course where you have part of the course online, part of the course face-to-face. Mm-hmm. You kind of have the best of both worlds, the convenience of online learning and some of the social interaction p- piece of, uh, of the face-to-face classroom. Mm-hmm. When you look at a program level, you can mix and blend a, a program so that you have online courses, face-to-face courses, and even blended courses. And offering a variety of options to students gives them some agency so that they can choose their own path, fit their own circumstances, whatever they might be. Mm -hmm. I would assume then a couple things. You tell me if I'm right or wrong. I would assume that you probably have a greater diversity of students because of these options. And I would assume that the online courses are probably a little bit less expensive than what colleges charge to sit in the classroom. Am I right or wrong about either or both of those? 
I think in general in online learning, your yeah. first statement is correct. But right. at UCF, what we find is that the diversity of the, of the student profile is about the same mm -hmm. because online learning is so integrated into everything that we do. Right. Um, at our school, what we do is that the, um, the tuition is exactly the same. Right. However, for certain programs, for students who are 100% online, who will never be coming to campus, we are able to reduce their out-of-pocket costs by eliminating fees that are associated with campus services that they won't be using. Mm -hmm. So it can, it can be a significant, maybe a 20% discount for them. Yep. So I'm curious as to how the success of this program is being met inside the academic community. I happen to know that that can be a very political community, the <laughs> academic community. Yeah. How is it being received? How is it being pushed back against? How is it being talked about? Um, and I want to come up in a moment to how employers are taking this because I, I remember some years ago when this online learning thing became a really big deal, there were some people sort of, how can I put this nicely, poo-pooing mm -hmm. online education that you don't get the same kind of instruction, you don't mm -hmm. get the same kind of learning, that the online classes are not nearly as regarded as mm -hmm. in-classroom learning. So just give me some sense, first of all, how this program is being received inside of the academic community beyond the campus of UCF. Well, you know, the big elephant in the room is quality, right? Yeah, yeah. Everybody sort of brings that up. Sure. And I think maybe early days that was a legitimate concern, but there's been a body of research over the past 20 years that shows no significant difference between work that's done online, or at least outcomes from online, and outcomes from face-to-face. -face. Mm -hmm. I have a colleague at UCF who likes to say it was only since the, the dawn of online learning that face-to-face -face instruction became the gold standard mm -hmm. of, of quality education. And I think that there is still that element out there of, of people who question the validity of online learning. Mm -hmm. However, it's changing. And I think it's changing mostly from faculty who are teaching online. And they realize that they can do things online that conceivably they can't even do face to face and expand the world for their students in ways that the internet provides for them. Mm -hmm. how, how does the university decide then um, what are the criteria for whether a course can be taught online mm -hmm. versus in the classroom? It's a, it's a dialogue with yeah. the faculty member and with the department. And ultimately, it's the academic community's decision whether or not to put something online. And what I do and my department does is work with faculty to see what we can do to bring all of the resources to bear of media, of the internet, to make that a quality course. And ultimately, though, it's their decision. Yeah. How, how, does, um, how does the university go about dealing with um, authenticity. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's always the question with online anything. Sure, sure. Is what I'm getting real? Is this really the student? Is this really yeah. the student's work that the student has turned in? How do you deal with that? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. It's probably the number one question that I get. Yeah. And there are a variety of tools and strategies that you can do, that you can employ to, to ensure the authenticity of, of a student's identity. Mm -hmm. So there's video, there is um, all kinds of biometrics, there, there are all kinds of tools that you can put in place. And, and we use a number of them at our school, and we're not unique, a number of schools do this. So I think you can get to a point where you have some validity that this is the student that you think it is. I, I would question maybe even a large lecture hall where you have a couple of hundred students Unless you're checking IDs at the door, mm -hmm. you might have a similar problem. Another question has to do with, are they cheating online? And we work really hard with our faculty to design tests that are kind of cheat-proof for mm -hmm. online, so you're not just testing cognitive Is recall. there such a thing? Well, <laughs> no, actually. Not when I was in school, it was. I mean, no. I'm not speaking for myself. I'm just yeah. my friends. <laughs> I have a friend. Yeah, yeah I have a friend. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, no, there's, there's no cheat-proof anything, face-to-face yeah. -face or right. online. Right. However, I think there are some tools in the online world that aren't available in the face-to-face -face world. You can randomize questions, you can time exams, you can use pools of questions, you can check IP addresses to make sure students aren't colluding together. There's all mm -hmm. kinds of tools that you can use that I think help to mitigate that issue. It seems to me though that while you can do that, that puts an additional burden on the faculty member um, to have to go through all those checks and balances, so to speak, and how do they respond to being asked to do that additional legwork? Some of it I would say falls on folks like myself, right. the more technical right. uh, solutions. Um, but in the course and assessment design, I think that if a faculty member builds that in up front, it's not really a whole lot more work um, if, if they've got resources like ours to help them. Mm -hmm. So the other question I want to get to here is uh, beyond how it's received in the academic community or not received by some institutions, mm -hmm. how's it being regarded in the world of employment? So when one gets these degrees, what do you know, is it too soon to tell, you tell me, 
about whether or not these online degrees lead to jobs? I think it depends on the credibility of the institution. Mm -hmm. So if you have a degree from a respected, accredited institution, regardless of the modality that it's delivered in, then I think it's the reputation of that institution that um, speaks to how valid that degree is. Mm -hmm. If it's some sort of a, uh, an institution that's not accredited or it's had problems um, mm -hmm. <laughs> with some scandals or something like that, then yeah, I would question that. I would question that whether it's face-to-face -face or online. Yeah. In some cases, many of those kinds of schools happen to offer a large number of online programs. Yeah. And I think in some cases, Online learning has been painted with a broad brush, um, driven by some of the bad actors in the space. Mm -hmm. But by and large, most public institutions like mine, a lot of private institutions, offer online learning. And I would put the quality of it up there with anything face-to-face. -face. And I would assume then um, that there's no difference in the degree. There's nothing on the degree that says that this student received this degree for taking, you know, there's no... No, yeah. no there's not. Um, it's the same faculty, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's the same curriculum, yeah. same outcome, same requirements. And in some cases, like I said, 80% of our students will take a mixture of modalities. Right. Um, they might take most face-to-face -face and a few online, or most online and some face-to-face, -face, or all online. It's really kind of up to the student. Yeah. So tell me what you think the future holds, because I can see this working a couple of different ways. I can, I can make the argument that it's a good thing and it's a bad thing. <laughs> um, I, I, from, 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 the instant, from the standpoint of the institution, as long as you got enough people signing up for this and there's money being made, not that I want to reduce education to money, yeah. um, but institutions have to survive. Um, if you're giving discounts to these online students, that's less money ultimately coming into the institution if over the long run you see more kids signing up for online courses than for classroom courses. Mm -hmm. That could be a challenge for the institution. On the other hand, um, there are these questions that of course remain about, you address some of them now, about the validity of this online learning. So I'm just trying to get a sense of where you think the future is going to take us with regard to how we do these blended courses. I think by and large, the, we're turning the corner yeah. uh, the, on those questions of, of is this quality. I think we've got enough literature, enough research, enough just anecdotal evidence of, of people we know who've gone through programs like mm -hmm. this to say that, okay, this can be a quality experience. Um, you know, to your first point about the, the finances, mm -hmm. um, we like to think that making money is sort of the worst reason to get into this. Mm -hmm. uh, it should be for other reasons, to support institutional mission, access, you know, success, um, helping students to, to make their way through a degree program. And then if you do all those things right, the money sort of takes care of itself. Mm -hmm. And in our case, the discount that we've, that we've applied to our fully online programs is only in fees. So it's for services the students aren't accessing anyway. Right. So the tuition revenue, if you will, Still remains the same. The same. Yeah. 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 Um, you think, by, by and large, this is a good turn for academia in America? I think it is in the sense that there are some students, there's a whole population of students, particularly mm -hmm. underserved students, underrepresented students, who must work, who have family commitments, and want to get an education. And they can't quit their job and go Monday, Wednesday, Friday at 10 o'clock in the morning to a class. Online learning offers them a path that wasn't there before. And I think that we can make that available to students um, to help them improve their situations, to get the education that they want. Mm -hmm. I also think that there are technologies that are being experimented in through online learning, like adaptive learning and personalized learning, that potentially could have an impact in the future if they prove to be successful. As I mentioned at the top of this conversation, this is the last in our series for this year about the future of education in this country. If you've missed any of these conversations, go to our website at Tavis Smiley or go to PBS forward slash, it's not my website, go to PBS forward slash Tavis Smiley. You can download and look at any of the conversations we've had, all of them this year, about the future of education in America. Tom Cavanaugh from UCF, thank you, sir. Thank you. Good to have you on, thanks for your insights. That was so cool, Tom. You're famous. Yeah, super famous. <laughs> At least on Facebook when I told everybody and uh, shared right. the link with my mom. That's, uh, she's like, cool. Uh, so, but seriously, in all, in all honesty, I really do think that was a good example for us to, to give it a listen to and think about some principles that uh, we can kind of deconstruct from there that we can all apply, right? As I said, sometimes I sometimes I do a good job when folks ask these basic questions, uh, but sometimes when it hits me out of left field, I'm just like, seriously? Yeah, sometimes I f it, it's easier for me and I feel more comfortable to answer questions about, you know, what assignments should be online versus face-to-face -face mm -hmm, in a blended mm -hmm. class as opposed to 
Um, you know, is online as good as face to face? Right. Right. And and sometimes I got pull, really pulled into the weeds. I'm like, well, here's a, you know, or sometimes I'm just shocked because it's kind of like, so do we really think that gravity works? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's the question of the bubble. You know, we, we yes. live in this bubble and, and we talk to each other and we all kind of understand the same frame of reference. And doing something like this where you talk to somebody who's a very informed professional journalist but does not live in the world of online learning and you're in a very public kind of forum to do it, um, you want to make sure that you respond a- appropriately to these kinds of questions and not get defensive about them, uh, you know, questions about cheating or about rigor or about is it as good as and all of that. Mm-hmm. It's a natural question. And, and sometimes you forget that those questions are out there. When you live in this world every day, you, you don't ask yourselves those questions quite as frequently as somebody who, who maybe doesn't live in online learning <laughs> would ask. Yeah, I think that's true. So, do you mind if I just run down my little list of, uh, this isn't like super elegant or anything. These are just some things that suggested themselves to me when I was given a listen. And just maybe see if you react to, see if you agree with, and see if we get some consensus on these, right? No particular order. So, know the facts. Yeah, don't lie. (laughs) Or or don't make it up. Yeah, I mean, you knew stuff. I mean, there were actual, oh, you know, nearly 80% of, you know, what, you know, and so you've got a thing. Um... And yet, at the same time, avoid getting pulled into the weeds, and maybe not pulled in. Avoid going into the weeds. <laughs> you know, like we we know our stuff so well, and we're in love with it, and all. Little illustrative examples, fine, but if you, you can go so zoomed in that you lose people. Yeah, and that that's hard to do sometimes because when you do know the facts, like you know those of us who spend our careers working in this space, um, no, it's it's hard to to skim the surface of that at an executive summary level. Yeah. I was in a meeting yesterday and the, the president of our university happened to be in the meeting and somebody described something that was really good and really uh, eloquent. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and <laughs> President Hitt said, um, I may not get the quote exactly right, but he said, that's awesome. I loved everything you said, but if that's your elevator pitch, you're going to need a taller building. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was great. <laughs> yeah, and and that's a good that's a good little lesson here, as well as kind of practice the elevator pitch version. And yeah, you know you know uh, my hashtag irony statement that I say often, right? Is uh, I don't do pithy. <laughs> yeah, hashtag irony. Um, but I think too, and I think you we talked about this right when you got back from uh, from flying out to California to do the show. But y- you have to anticipate. You have to put yourself in the. The, the hypothetical shoes of the person who's, who's talking to you, anticipate the questions or assumptions, maybe even misperceptions. Not that I thought that uh, Mr. Smiley was uh, uninformed necessarily or anything, but just you got to anticipate that. Would you agree? Yeah, you have to. I, I did not know what the questions were going to be. Mm-hmm. In fact, I had asked for them ahead of time. <laughs> Some of our news and information people had asked for mm-hmm. them ahead of time. And the producer was pretty clear. It's like, well, first of all, don't worry. Uh-huh. Um, but second of all, um, it's really just a conversation mm-hmm, between mm-hmm. you and Tavis, mm-hmm, and you know mm-hmm. he will have some questions that he's interested in, but it's going to be sort of where does the conversation go? Mm-hmm. So I couldn't really anticipate what he was going to ask me. So I, I did in my head think through what would be some common questions and how would I potentially answer some of those. Yeah, I think it was good, and uh, and with that though, I guess there's some stay on point, stay on message. Not horribly so, mind you, but kind of have a message. Just kind of know the facts, but have a message and, yeah. and, and be willing to get that across somehow. And I'm, I'm not very good at the politician right. thing of uh, no matter what you're asked. <laughs> answer whatever you want. Answer whatever you want. Yeah, I tend to try to actually answer the question that's been asked of me, which has sometimes gotten me in trouble. Uh-huh. Uh, but I, I think it was okay in this case. Yeah, I think so too. And my problem I find, I don't know if others can uh, relate to this, is sometimes from a, from a point of personal transparency and authenticity – I will, to the nth degree, say, yeah, you're right. We don't do a real good job of that, com- you know, compared to where we might want to be. And that can take you down a, a, a rabbit hole, right? As opposed yeah. to, well, say, compared to, you know, high level, you know, yes, we do a great job. You know, and just framing things is uh, is appropriate. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, I don't know if you re- resonate with this, but I thought, uh, you know, kind of in the uh, whose line is it anyway? Kind of there's in the theater sports stuff. There's kind of a yes and kind of go with, follow the energy. Mm-hmm. Like I, 
you know, uh, Tavis Smiley, he goes uh, direction. You follow him. Now, you, you still have some points, and you're going to address those points, but you're willing to go with him. Sure. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's a it's a question of acknowledging the concern, right? Yeah. I mean, it's a legitimate concern. It, mm-hmm. You know, it, hey, online, it seems like they would cheat more. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. it's not the first time I've heard that question. No. So acknowledge that and and then try to give a response to it. Yeah. And there was a lot more I could have said about of that. Of course. Right? You know, of if course. I had more time, I, right. I could have gone into a lot more detail and I think made an even better case. Mm-hmm. But you can't just be defensive and, right. s- and say, you know, uh, I reject that question. Yes. <laughs> you know, how many times do I have to answer that question? That's not a good way to respond. Yeah, right. Or, or well, well, goodness, they cheat face-to-face too. Right. That sounds <laughs> equally defensive. <laughs> That's yeah. right. So you got to, you know, find that right thing here. And, and then finally, while neither you nor Tavis Smiley said the words Iron Triangle, which we've talked about in previous episodes of TopCast, construct, the ideas were there. And I wondered if that construct informed your message points and your your responses. I mean, are you thinking iron triangly? Yeah, but you know what? I was speaking a lot from my own personal experience here at UCF, yeah. and, and we think that way yeah, here. And right, so, right. you know, either directly or indirectly, I think that that definitely informs kind of all of my responses, mm-hmm. <laughs> even mm-hmm. outside of that forum. Yeah, no, I think that makes sense. So to me, that just underscores uh, maybe it's maybe it's a message point thing, but it's what is the big picture? What are the constructs that you can kind of hang your hat on and anchor back to and see how you're doing and mm-hmm. so forth? So I don't know. I thought good interview, good principles. Maybe we can all take those and and try to apply them when we're outside of our bubble. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and if I could just take uh, one moment to thank the the entire Tavis Smiley production yes. team. One, they gave us permission to use that, that which recording, is awesome. which is really nice, and I appreciate that. Um, and then everybody on the staff and, and Mr. Smiley himself uh, for having me, they, they were really great about prepping and setting it up and just sort of um, giving us a forum to talk about something that we care a lot about. So bottom line it for us and take us home, Tom. So for us, working in online education, sooner or later, someone outside of our immediate context is going to ask, you know, honest, Mm -hmm. (laughs) challenging questions about the value of online education. So Mm -hmm. it behooves all of us Mm -hmm. um, if we're able to do a good job in responding to those questions. Think about it, anticipate it, and, you know, just be polite. I had a friend on Facebook, after I kind of posted the link, as Uh I'm prone to do, um, who said, Gee, you know, I, you took a boring subject and made it interesting. It's like, <laughs> like what boring subject? I know. I was talking about what I do every day. <laughs> Thanks. It's only my career <laughs> that you were talking about. Uh, and this is a guy who sells lockers for a living. <laughs> Just say it. Just saying. I love him. If he's listening, I'm sure he's not. <laughs> Great guy. <laughs> oh, that's so funny. anyway, it's all relative. It, it is. It is. It is. <laughs> So if you haven't visited uh, the TopCast website, please do. We have lots of good stuff out there. We have uh, ways to interact, Mm -hmm. send emails, um, look at show notes, not just for this show, but for every show. And we'll have a link to the actual uh, interview if you wanted to watch that. Um, Maybe we'll put the uh, interviews to those other two in his series as well, Mm -hmm. Gerald Hyman and Janet Napolitano. Yeah, that's a good idea. Websites at uh, topcast.online.ucf.edu. And iTunes. iTunes. If you like this podcast. And we hope you do. (laughs) We hope you do. Um, And you think others might appreciate it as well. Uh, A great way to help them find Mm -hmm. it is to give us a review uh, on iTunes. It it affects the algorithm that that helps in search results and all that. Or goodness, we'd love that. But if you can only just manage to click a star, that would be fine too. We'd take that that star rating. (laughs) There you go. That'd be be okay. All right. So uh, I think for another TopCast... I'm Tom. I'm still Kelvin. (laughs) See ya.